ました。So we're going, we're going to start. It's a pleasure for, to introduce uh, Lynn Nadell as our next speaker. Thank you. So Lynn Nadell was my PhD supervisor. When I started in 1990, he was chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of Arizona. He then became interim dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. He also served as provost. He chaired uh, several high-level steering committees. He um, is now chair of the faculty and regents professor. While Lynn Nadell is best known for his book uh, with John O'Keefe, The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map, uh, he was also the author of the Multiple Trace Theory. And um, unknown to many of us in the learning and memory community, he actually edited about a dozen books in the field of Down syndrome. Uh, his substantial contributions led to several pre prestigious awards, especially for the Down syndrome um, accomplishments. Uh, Lynn Nadell touched many lives. But most important, uh, he had really a significant impact in uh, the lives of graduate students and the faculty at the University of Arizona. So I'm going to give a, a few uh, examples. When he was provost, I actually uh, went to meet him at some point, and his administrative assistant then told me something that I didn't know, which I'm going to share with you today. Apparently, uh, Lynn Nadell is really appreciated by the faculty, especially the faculty who are working in administration. Apparently, he's really good when he's sitting on commi committees. He is so good that everyone wants to lend on a committee, and I'm going to tell you why. So um, I actually w one time asked Lynn, what's, what's your secret? And he shared it with me, and I'm going to tell you what the secret is to being, in a, great, being a, a great member of a committee. So Lynn's answer was actually surprisingly simple. He said, you have to find out what people want and then try to give them what they want. <laughs> so here you have it. Um, uh, if you are ever in need of an administrator in one of your committees, you will always find an ally in Lynn Nadell. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Lynn Nadell. Thank you very, Nick, for those kind words, about half of which were true. Um, thank you also to the organizers for inviting me. I have a sort of a similar story to tell as Jim told, which was when I accepted this very kind invitation, I thought, oh, okay, small meeting, 50 people, you know, what the hell, might as well show up. Uh, I was rather surprised by the, what it turned out to be, and it's really great. It's turned into an incredible meeting. Uh, it's also Thank you for the honor and privilege of following Jim McGaw, which is, of course, impossible. Um, I'm going to tell a bit of a history story. I'm going to kind of bring it up to the modern time as well. Uh, and I'm going to dance lightly over some of the same things that Jim mentioned. But I think you'll see there's a somewhat similar perspective in some cases and a somewhat different perspective in others. So I changed the title slightly. And it probably would be more appropriate to say some ways in which my thinking about memory has changed in the past 35 years uh, than the field as a whole. But it seemed more appropriate to think about it this way. So I'm going to jump back. Ooh, that's a little bit off the screen. I hope that doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to mention very briefly a few uh, rather, it's frozen. OK, sorry. So if you go back even earlier than what Jim did. You can, and I, I'm going way back. Jim mentioned Aristotle. I only want to bring to your attention a few points, which is that some critical ideas that we now hold about memory have been around for a very long time, as Jim pointed out. These are not new ideas. So the notion that association is at the root of learning, that goes back to Aristotle and beyond. The notion of a difference between recognition and recall was also recognized by Aristotle, even though he thought the heart was the locus. That doesn't matter. He had the right idea conceptually. The notion of mental time travel, 
showed up in St. Augustine. The notion of the memory theater and the method of loci and the kind of critical connection between memory and space was already there in the Middle Ages. So these ideas already existed in the Middle Ages. Nothing much is new. The British empiricists added a, a kind of a focused attention on the notion of association. What causes it? What makes things become associated? That's the basic glue of learning and memory, according to them. What causes it? What are the rules of association? I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and then Jim did mention that, you know, towards the end of the 19th century, things began to get experimental. He mentioned Rebo and Ebbinghaus. I don't need to focus on them. And there's something strange about the way this is working, and I don't know what it is. All right. James. Jim mentioned James. I don't need to go back to James. Then the 50-year interregnum during which behaviorism and, you know, spearheaded by Watson sort of ruled the day. Memory was ruled out of court. You, didn't, you did not utter the word memory if you were a psychologist during that era. Jim mentioned Lashley as one of the kind of people during that era who was still making important progress. Also worthy of mention is Sir Frederick Bartlett who published a very important book in 1932 called Remembering, in which he pointed out that memory is a constructive thing. Memories are not things, they're constructed. This is, and this turns out to be an extremely important insight that you know, is part of the field as well. Then came the war. This was still in the behaviorist period. During the war, a couple of very important things happened. Well, many things happened, of course. But with respect to our particular interest in the field, the, the existence of, of war-injured veterans who survived. So the first thing that happened is that people were surviving injuries that they didn't used to survive. So now they were surviving injuries that gave some insight into the effects of, of, of damage to the brain and to the head. And that led to a paper shortly after the Second World War. Russell and Nathan published a paper where they documented retrograde amnesia that lasted days, month, weeks, months, and so on. This was the, sort of the return of the notion of retrograde amnesia and the idea that, that it takes time for, for memories to be established, the notion of consolidation. I'll come back to that. And then, as Jim pointed out, Hebb's opus in 49 sort of changed the game. Now, I was a graduate student at McGill in the 60s, and, and so I was brought up in the kind of the Hebbian framework that, that you're about to, to understand now. Then comes the modern era of HM. Okay, so here's the way things actually happened, according to my, my, my understanding of the story. When Scoville operated on HM and they observed the memory defect, Scoville himself was not a behavioral neurologist. He didn't know what to do with it. He basically didn't know how to handle it. He contacted his colleague, uh, Penfield, in Montreal, who had recently published something related to this notion. Penfield didn't have the time to deal with it. He contacted his colleague. Penfield was at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Hebb was in the psychology department. Penfield contacted Hebb, and Hebb sent Brenda Milner. This is Brenda Milner then, as a graduate student, said, Brenda, you take this task on. And Brenda started to study HM. Right? And Brenda, who, looked more, who looks more like this now, actually, even beyond then. Brenda's, by the way, celebrating her 100th birthday this year. And, there's going, and there is going to be, yeah, for Brenda. There is going to be an event in Montreal. I think it's the 5th and the 6th of, December, of September in honor of Brenda. I think it's kind of open. Is that true? I mean, people, if anyone who, I'm going to be there, and I imagine a lot of people are going to be there to honor Brenda. All right, so Brenda. Well, Brenda passed the task on to Sue Corkin who was her graduate student. And Sue then basically spent the rest of her life working on HM, but not only HM. She did a lot of work in Alzheimer's, did a lot of work in a variety of things, died sadly way too soon a few years ago, and published this fantastic book on HM. And just as a, a small world note, uh, she married my college roommate in 1961. <laughs> and that's how she got the name Corkin. And, and, as, and so I knew Sue before I'd ever thought about the brain which is strange. Now, the other thing that happened in the Second World War was the development of computers. And, and, and they were developed initially so that people trying to figure out artillery trajectories could figure them out more rapidly under conditions of battle. But th the lasting effect was the computer revolution that came out of the Second World War. And that computer revolution kind of led to ways of thinking about memory that were information processing based. So this was the way in which this came into the field. So, Standard kind of story. Um, I apologize to those whose I'm going to do sort of left side neglect if I 
do this. It's kind of hard to work with two screens. Anyway, the, the basic idea here is kind of co co computer-like in the way in which memory is supposed to work. And the information is meant to be processed through a series of temporally delineated memory systems unclear what they were from a neurological point of view, from a brain point of view, but this was a kind of a processing view of the way memory worked, very famous model. By the way, Rich Schifrin is still very active in the field, amazingly. Just saw him a month ago. Uh, so the idea is you have these, and they last a different length of time. Immediate memory, iconic memory, echoic memory, goes by different names, 120 milliseconds, roughly speaking. Then some of that material ends up in short-term memory that can be rehearsed and, and maintained for some period of time. A lot of it is forgotten. Some of it gets consolidated into long-term memory. This was the, the and, and Atkinson and Schifrin in their original 68 paper actually defaulted to HM. They used HM as a, as a, as a sort of a support for this model. They pointed out that, that HM supported their view because HM seemed to have, okay, this isn't working. HM seemed to have apparently intact um, short-term memory, as Jim pointed out, apparently intact long-term memory. We now know that this is, not ex this is not exactly true anymore, but this is the way it was reported in 57. Uh, but he had an inability to get material from short-term into long-term memory, new material. So there was some problem, in principle, with this consolidation phase. And the hippocampus, which they thought was the target of the surgery, was then assigned a kind of a catalytic role, some critical role in this consolidation process. But it wasn't, at this point in time, thought of as the place where the memories were stored, because indeed it, it appeared to be the case that he still had all of his old memories and so on. That, as I say, turns out not to be true. So you take out the hippocampus, you block consolidation, and you end up with HM. So this, this kind of way of thinking gave rise to a sort of a, a sense of the way the brain is organized that, that is kind of like this. You know, there's sensation, and a set of brain regions are associated with that. And then there's short-term memory, and there's a set of brain regions associated with that. And then there's long-term memory, and you've got a set of brain regions associated with that. Right? And they're kind of separate in some way. And that's what eventually gave rise to the idea that there was this medial temporal lobe memory system that was a specific thing just dealing with memory in the, in the way of that third box. OK, so far so good. Problem is when immediately after HM in 57, the sa same folks in Montreal, or roughly speaking the same folks, that's Jack Orbach, who was, I believe, Heb's last postdoc, uh, Brenda Milner and Theodore Rasmussen, who was a neurosurgeon at the Montreal Neurological Institute, tried to create an animal model. They took some monkeys. They made what they thought was the equivalent surgery in these monkeys that had been done in, a in HM. And lo and behold, no amnesia. Nothing that looked the vaguest bit like what they'd seen in HM. The same thing showed up in rats. The work that was done in rats in the early 60s by Kimball and Isaacson and others, no memory, no apparent learning and memory deficit after hippocampal lesions. So this was really, this was when I grew up. So Jim grew up in the era 10 years earlier. This was the era I grew up in in the 60s. I was a graduate student then. And it was, how shall we put it, chaos <laughs> as a graduate student. There was this apparent disjunct between what the hippocampus seems to be doing in humans and what it seems to be doing in animals. It was chaotic. In fact, I just unearthed a picture of a meeting from the 1960s showing just what it was like. It was. <laughs> it, it was shocking, I can tell you. I think I'm somewhere off in the corner there. Actually, that's not true. Okay. All right. So this chaos in the hippocampal world in the 1960s led to the thought that you know, maybe the rat hippocampus and the human hippocampus are doing something different, as I said. And there, you can see they're in kind of different parts of the overall structure of the brain. Maybe you could entertain this idea. This guy wouldn't like that idea. Those of you who don't recognize this is an early picture of Charles Darwin. So the idea that you would have a structure <coughs> that has evolved for 350 million years or longer that is suddenly going to take on an entirely new function that no other animal, I mean, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So where do you go from there? And in fact, we didn't go anywhere very good for a while. For five or 10 years, the field was in chaos, literally in chaos. And those were my years as a graduate student. And I contributed to the chaos <laughs> because I, can, I did a, a dissertation on hippocampus that as I say, contributed to the chaos. But then some years later, things changed. 
And this is, I think this was the event that actually changed the way the field went because it sort of refocused people's energy on how to think about the memory role of the hippocampus. So John O'Keefe discovered the play cells in the hippocampus. That's from the first paper. Then John and I wrote that book. By the way, it's available for free download if you want to. I think that link still exists. Uh, the book is worth reading for historical purposes, I would say. But the, the, the thing I want to stress here is that everyone, the reaction to the, to the place cells and to the cognitive map theory and all of that was, OK, this is, a, this is a story about space and the hippocampus. What people didn't really appreciate, I think, and which is what this talk is going to focus on, is that from the very beginning, this was a, this was a theory about memory. So I point out to you this quote. This is not buried on page 373 of the book. This is on page 1, right? That the hippocampus is the core of a neural memory system. That was always the core of the theory, even though that's not what got focused on and that's not what got paid attention to, right? So I'm going to, now, now for the actual talk. I'm going to talk about the implications of cognitive map theory for memory, because it was a theory about memory. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about consolidation, and then I'm going to end up with some more recent things about reconsolidation, which is where we've gotten to lately. All right, so the first thing you can ask, and this, by the way, of course, just latches right on to what Jim said. This is all following on Tolman in many ways. What is memory for? What is memory for? Jim said it is what ties everything together. Yes, that's true. It allows us to behave appropriately, but memory is used to predict. So, so what we said very early on, this was actually in a paper before the book was published in 70, this was a 74 paper, that cognitive maps generate predictions. Just as Jim pointed out, Tolman had made the point is, the cognitive map tells the animal, if I do this, what's going to be the consequence? What's going to follow? So in other words, the, this theory was, a, was deeply embedded in the predictive notion of brain function. It started from that point. Memory is meant to predict there's a prediction that we're going to be facing pretty soon, right here probably. Second thing, how is memory organized in the brain? What is, the, how, is it spread out all over? Is it in separate boxes? How, how to think about the organization of memory in the brain? The, the central point of the, of, the, of the cognitive map approach was that there are multiple memory systems. There is not one memory system. There are multiple memory systems. So here are some quotes, again, from the 74 and 78 paper making the point that there are different memory systems for different kinds of information. There are different types of memory localized in many, possibly most, neural systems. Memory is happening all over the brain. It's not just the, 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 the province of this particular structure. Right? These memory systems, in our view, differed by virtue of the kind of information they processed, not how long they processed it for. So that information processing model that I gave you, it distinguished between different types of memory in terms of how long they held the memory for. This is a different approach. This is an approach that says, no, a particular type of memory, say spatial memory or face memory or whatever, the same brain system is going to be involved in every temporal part of that memory. It's going to be there at the beginning. It's going to be there in the middle. It's going to be there at the end. Right? So this, it's, it's the nature of the kind of information that is being processed that determines what the system is doing, not how long it does it for. Right? Again, here's a quote. There's no such thing as the memory area. Different areas are responsible for different kinds of memories. This, again, I think follows on the kinds of things Jim was pointing out. These memory systems now differ in terms of functional properties. So the different parts of the brain that are responsible for these different kinds of memory have different computational structure, different wiring diagrams, different processes. So they're doing different things. Right? At the time, in, in 74, when we were thinking about these issues, LTP had just been discovered. Right? And it had been discovered in the hippocampus. And it was this rapid plasticity mechanism in the hippocampus that we thought, incorrectly at the time, maybe didn't exist anywhere else in the brain for this rapid plasticity. And therefore, the hippocampus has this mechanism for rapidly acquiring information, just what you would want it to do, given the role that everyone was assigning to it. And it was a function of this physiological property of the underlying system. That turns out not to be quite true in the long run, because LTP is all over the place. But it is a rapid plasticity mechanism, and it does connect to our ability to acquire information rapidly. So there's this, rapid learning. 
The different systems, they differ in terms of the information they represent. Some represent places, faces, shapes, and so on. They differ in terms of developmental trajectory. This is really important. These different systems, I mean, different kinds of memory become available at different points in the trajectory of development in life. Right, this graph is, shows it somewhat. This is where I concentrated a lot of my work when I was here at Irvine in the, in the early 1980s. I was running a developmental lab looking at the, the impact of various things in early development on the emergence of different kinds of memory. This work led to the work on Down syndrome, which I've been doing, had been doing for some time. It has now been largely taken over and vastly enhanced and improved by my colleague Jamie Edgen. If you want to learn a little bit more about her work, I suggest you go and check out her slide uh, her, uh, at the symposium that she's a part of. I think that's on the fourth day. Jim already alluded to this point. These different memory systems, because, of, because they are responsible for representing and processing different kinds of information, enable different sorts of behaviors, different kinds of strategies. So Jim alluded to the response and play strategies. The idea here is that this is the same figure. I'm not going to run through what Jim ran through already. The idea is that, sorry, is that different brain systems are responsible for, re for the ability to do response strategies or for the ability to do play strategies and so on, M more or less as Jim has already alluded to, and I'll say a bit more about that later. There are some other implications that I'm going to briefly mention. Memory consolidation is not quite what we thought it was. I'll come back to this again. And there is this deep connection between memory and space, which we pushed on very hard, but which, as I said, had already been known in the Middle Ages. And now when you go back to the work that Jim and his colleagues are doing on these people with superior memory, a lot of them use the method of loci. I mean, the fact that these spatial mnemonics are so powerful speaks to the underlying brain mechanisms that support them and their relationship to memory. All right, the focus, of course, in, in our work was on hippocampus. We said it represented information about space and episodes, and that it supported behavior that was dependent upon context and places. So here was an early study that sort of demonstrated what we were talking about. In this task, I don't know, again, I, this isn't going to work, right? OK. Um, this is a circuit, this is an annulus, and the rats are running around. It's open to the environment. There's eight water wells, the little dots that you can see. They're all identical. There's nothing that differentiates the one from the other. It's open to the room. The rat has to go to the correct one. I put a colored, it's the green dot up there in the 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock position. The Thank you. Top button. Top button? Thanks. It must be my fingers are not working. Um, <laughs> it's OK. Uh, you can see from where my finger is pointing. Uh, <laughs> something wrong with me, apparently. This is weird. I swear my fingers don't work anymore. All right, oh, there we go. Anyway, the rat had to go here, stay there for three seconds and sniff at the well, and then we would pump water in from underneath. So there was nothing locally to tell the rat what, where to go. What we saw in this initial experiment was that animals with fornix lesions were completely incapable of solving this task. They simply could not do it, all right? Now, we move to the second version of the task. Now, we put a little light. Right? that shines on that spot. Now the animal doesn't have to figure out where to go in space. It just has to go where the light is shining. Now, immediately, the same exact animals were immediately capable of performing this task. They didn't have a problem going and stopping and sniffing and all of that stuff. That was no problem. The problem was figuring out where to go. And without a hippocampus, they couldn't do it. That was the claim. Now we did, we did the, addition, the extra step. Whoops, sorry. Whoops. Hate this stuff, don't I? Isn't this great? All right. Now, if you move the light to another location, what you see is that the control animals who had learned to go to the place continue to go to the place. The fornix lesioned animals simply go where the light is. They don't care about the place. And so this was, this was our first, earliest demonstration of this idea that different strategies are supported by different brain systems, and that you can have an animal with a, without a hippocampus who can do perfectly well as long as you don't ask them to learn about places. Jim pointed out, you know, the same sort of story emerges between caudate and hippocampus, your fornix as well. This is a spatial task. 
where there's a, a, a selective deficit in the fornix lesioned animals. This is a non-spatial task, a selective deficit in the caudate animals. And the fornix lesioned animals do perfectly fine. This is the Packard and McGaw study that I think Jim referred to. All right, so what have I told you so far? I've told you that the brain organizes memory in a distributed sort of content-based way, that there are multiple systems and that they each sort of represent a different kind of information, and that these different systems have different, very important ways. And, and really, there are entire research careers that, can be, that have been based on exploring these various things. No, I'm pressing the wrong button, that's why. So this gives rise to a somewhat different view of the way the brain organizes information and, 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 and learning. Instead of these boxes being separate, what this is telling us is that the same brain regions do sensation, perception, and memory. Depends on what the content of the information is. Right? And all of these things fall into the same box. All right. This idea, this multiple forms of memory idea, was actually discussed in one of the, in one of the early Irvine conferences. Dan Schachter, who's in the room, where are Dan's back there? Dan gave a talk in the 85 conference, which is, I think, the second conference in the series. And he began to talk about multiple systems in, in, as, as being important. This idea was really beginning to take hold. This was the same meeting at which there were some pretty intense debates about the nature of consolidation that went on between the two Larrys, uh, Larry Weiskrantz on the one hand and Larry Squire on the other. And it was, it was a pretty interesting meeting for those of us who were standing in the background. Um, all right, this takes me to consolidation. So what is consolidation? I don't need to spend a lot of time here. Jim already ran through of it. I'm going to let you, so the, the, one of the interesting things about consolidation is that it was very, from the very beginning, it was construed not just in physiological terms. It wasn't just a physiological process that led eventually to the stabilization of, of a memory. It was also a kind of a psychological reconstruction of the information. That got lost in most of the consolidation work until very recently. Right? That idea that there was something going on with the information itself, that consolidation might be changing the information in some way, integrating it with all, there's a lot of things one can say, but it isn't just a process that once you start it just does its thing, it's like a chemical thing. It isn't just that, it's also a psychological thing. And again, as Jim pointed out, all of this was largely ignored until the 1950s. So what happened? The Russell and Nathan paper that talked about ret retrograde amnesia, Hebb invoking it in his cell assembly theory. Jim talked about that. This is where Jim's work really focused. Animal studies using drugs or ECS to disrupt brain activity. That sort of indicated that there was a consolidation processing process that lasted on the order of seconds, minutes, something like that. But work with humans emphasized a much longer time span for consolidation. So we end up with modern discussions that distinguish between the cellular aspects of consolidation and the system level aspects of consolidation. And the long term things are really about the systems level of consolidation. So what are we talking about here? Well, now we go back to HM. Actually, since HM, there's been this focus on the interaction between hippocampus and, and cortex as the kind of core of systems level consolidation. The idea being that the hippocampus was only temporarily critical for memory. So memories were either established in the hippocampus and moved somewhere else crazy idea from a biological perspective, or the, or the hippocampus was somehow critical for the, for the access to and retrieval of information that was elsewhere in the brain for this period of time. And that over consolidation time, these other parts of the brain where the memory actually was, acquire the ability to sort of activate themselves so that you can retrieve that information, you can get to it without the, without the sort of intervention of the hippocampus. That was the idea. But if the, if the memories were never in the hippocampus in the first place, then why is it so important? I mean, what, role, what is the role of the hippocampus, given that it isn't storing memories? So this is what the, the so-called standard model of consolidation tried to, this was what it tried to answer. OK, so now you go back to this story, HM, consolidation problem. And the idea was that the hippocampus served as a kind of a, uh, you might say, an intermediate term memory system, right? That allowed you to still access the information and work on it, while stuff was happening in, in the other parts of the brain where the information was located, the two direct errors, and over time, the memory would be established in a self-sustaining way outside the hippocampus, and the hippocampus, the role of the hippocampus fades away and is gone. This idea, by the way, was originally generated in an era when people thought there might be capacity limitations in the hippocampus, and that basically you needed to actually erase what the hippocampus had been doing 
Because if the hippocampus stored everything you ever did, your brain would explode by the age of 30 or something like that. So given that that can't be the case, there was this capacity limitation idea. You had to re, you know, reset, the, reset the curve, wipe, wipe the hippocampus clean, and go back, use the same cells again for another purpose. All right? That was the idea. That's the standard model. Reactivation, and you see that for an old memory trace, the hippocampus is not involved. For an, for, for at the beginning, it is involved. It links together a bunch of cortical nodes. They, they link themselves together over consolidation. End of story. Along comes multiple trace theory. There were problems with this story. One particular problem was that the period of retrograde amnesia just seems to last way too long. It's on the order of 10, 15, with a sufficient lesion, 20, 25 years. Reports began to come out that suggested that if this is a temporary memory system, then we have a different notion of the word temporary. Uh, and indeed, you know, for a system that probably evolved when the average lifespan was 35 or 40, to have a memory, have consolidation last for 25 years, that doesn't sound temporary. So we wanted to go back to square one with the notion of temporary. You may remember that the, in the cognitive map theory, we said it wasn't temporary. Cognitive map, in the book, we said the hippocampus actually stored things, that it was a permanent system. Okay, so we're going back to that idea. Now, in multiple trace theory, that was done in collaboration with Morris Moscovich, the hippocampus plays a role in storing and retrieving episode context-dependent memory, even if these memories are remote. That doesn't matter. As long as they're sufficiently vivid, the hippocampus is involved. But it only plays a temporary role in the establishment of semantic memory. So you have to distinguish between episodic and semantic memory. That was also not a part of the standard model of consolidation. The hippocampus has this specific role in representing spatial contextual relations, but it does it in a way that is not reproducible elsewhere in the brain. This is an important point. This goes back to the Fornix study. There's no way those animals could solve that task because it required what the, only the hippocampus could do. That's a strong claim that the, you cannot substitute. This gets to the point that a particular brain region is doing something unique. It may interact with the rest of the brain, as Jim pointed out, but it is doing its own unique thing. All right? But we added this following assumption that a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I've been doing more recently uh, sort of rests on, which is that retrieving an episode memory initiates new encoding that can alter and expand the old trace. That shows when you reactivate a memory, something happens. Right? And so by this view, an old memory is not, in fact, devoid of hippocampal involvement. In fact, it's got substantial, in fact, expanded hippocampal involvement because it's been reactivated and the trace itself has been expanded. All right, so there are core predictions that come out of this view. I'm going to run through these very quickly. You can see them for yourself. Essentially, the hippocampus represents those things. It does it even for old memories. And when you're reactivated, something interesting happens. Those are core predictions. Right? This is one study. Quickly, I'm going to run through these data very quickly. This is more of an idea talk than a data talk. We, this was a study done with uh, Siobhan Hoshide and, and Lee Ryan, who's, I think, in the room. I don't think Jess Payne is here. Uh, we were simply looking at the, what, what, ac what excites the hippocampus the most. And we, we composed a, a kind of a, a task in the scanner where subjects were asked to think about events from their prior life. We had done an interview with them before. And, these, and then we asked them true-false questions that, that had the following character to them. They either were spatial and episodic, non-spatial and semantic, or all the varieties of the above. All right? And there were various controls. The, the key finding here is that, indeed, the hippocampus is most interested in spatial stuff compared to non-spatial stuff and episodic stuff compared to semantic stuff. And if it's spatial and episodic, I didn't show you the effect sizes here. This is the, this is the sweet spot. This is what excites the hippocampus the most, thinking about spatial and episodic things. There's another interesting finding that I'm not going to talk about here in any length at all, which is that the, the, the spatial part of the hippocampus and the memory part of the hippocampus seem to, to dissociate a little bit along the longitudinal axis of the hippocampus. And there's a very interesting emerging story about the longitudinal axis of the hippocampus that is coming out in the work now. By the way, when I said I contributed to the chaos in the field with my PhD, my PhD was on the longitudinal axis of the hippocampus. And it showed absolutely nothing. <laughs> Other than that you can get a PhD for showing absolutely <laughs> nothing. So, here, so, so, so the, this study pretty much shows that, yes, if the hippocampus is sort of most interested in a particular kind of content, what is it? This is what it is. 
you ask the question, okay, is it interested in this stuff when it's very old? So we did a study in which we asked some very old subjects. You can find them in Arizona. Well, yeah, I say this very old, and guess what? Jim, we're, we're both outside. The, we wouldn't qualify for this study. <laughs> Uh, we, we obtained, again, some information about them so that we could give them some cues in the scanner. Uh, and, and then we asked them about recent episodes and remote episodes. There were some control sentences to control for encoding issues. And lo and behold, we saw the same level of activation for both recent and remote memories in the hippocampus on both sides. Didn't matter. Right? Now, you might say, well, you had this, we did something a little silly in this experiment. We gave them the interview. Maybe they were thinking about the interview. We then did a version of it that we call the spousal control replication. So in this case, again, this is easily done in Arizona. You get some people who have been together for 40 or 50 years. You bring them into the lab. You separate them. You ask, do you think your spouse could tell us about X? And for the things they said yes, we put the spouse in the scanner. They've never been asked anything and then we ask them about X. And you get, essentially, the same result. It doesn't matter. They don't have to have thought about it the day before or the week before. Remote memories, if they're sufficiently interesting and vivid, activate the hippocampus to the same extent as recent memories. Just to catch you up a little bit, here's something from a paper that's under review from Mary Pat McAndrew. She's in the room somewhere, Mary Pat. So this basically closes the loop, and it shows you that it's the, na it's the issue of vividness. If it's a remote, vivid memory and you're pulling up lots of details, the hippocampus is going to be part of the story. It's got to do with the vividness of the memory. The hippocampus is not involved in remote memories that are kind of vague and uninteresting and so on. Okay. Second, so how are these memories made? The hippocampus makes these kind of memories, and, and we think it's engaged throughout the life of the memory, especially if it's vivid. Now, access to these details, the vividness part, seems to require the hippocampus. Though probably everybody in this room would agree, that's not where the, tail, the details are stored. So what's the role of the hippocampus in actually accessing these details? Right? The notion is, not a new idea, that the hippocampus indexes them. It sort of knows where they are and how to get them. This is the index theory of Tyler and DeSena. Right? So the hippocampus, the, the template that's formed in the hippocampus is actually a set of addresses as to where all those bits of information are in the cortex. That's the, that's the core idea. But our idea is that this, the hippocampal index is not just an index. It also relates the items to each other by virtue of their temporal and spatial relations to each other. That's the cognitive map part. Right? So the hippocampus is adding that information. This is Kantian. Those of you who are, who's the philosopher in the room? Who knows the name Kant? OK, not very many. This is a Kantian notion that the hippocampus enriches your experience by adding stuff to it. And what it's adding to it is the temporal spatial framework. All right, last part of the talk. I'm OK, sort of. Now, change and improve your memories, how memories are remade. Ca question is, can reacti reactivating a memory change it? This was one of the core ideas. Here's the traditional consolidation story. We now know it's not true, that if you reactivate a so-called fixed memory, it kind of unfixes it, and reconsolidation refixes it. Right? We know this because if you inject protein synthesis inhibitors, as, as uh, Kareem Nader and Joel Ledoux did, following on from earlier studies that hadn't done it quite so well, that you can actually possibly delete the memory. All right? But this doesn't make an awful lot of biological sense. It doesn't make sense that, that, that the system would evolve in a way that every time you think about a memory it's, and you get a little knock on the head, you're going to forget everything you learned. So that, there has to be some more positive, constructive purpose to, to the system being sort of fragile and flexible in this way. Our thought was that if you have a new related experience that reactivates some old memory, it's a good idea to actually update your, your old memory with new information. So you go, I go back to Tucson when the meeting is over, and I go in my front door, and my wife has rearranged the furniture in the living room. She doesn't do that very often, by the way, but it's possible. And then I, I'm going to have to update my cognitive map. I'm going to have to reactivate and update my map. So essentially, this is a mechanism for updating basically, old contents. We decided to study this in humans. We, we in this case, being Almut Hupback, who is here. Almut, somewhere in the room. Uh, Oliver Hart, who is now at, at McGill. And Rebecca Gomez. Rebecca, I think, is meant to be here, but I don't know if she's here or not. We designed this study where we could, where we could look at reconsolidation in a human episodic situation, which was unlike what people had been doing up to that point. So in this task, 
subjects learn essentially a list, a set of objects. Then they come back two days later, and we remind them or not of what they had done that day, and then we would train them another set of objects. So I'm not going to go into detail here, because there will be some posters I'll show you where later where you can see more of the details. Um, and the question was, it, what happens when you remind them of this first set and then train them a second set? Does that in some way allow for some of the items on the second set to be added to the first set memory, to update that memory? Right, that was our prediction, and that's exactly what happened. But it only happens in the case where you remind the subjects of what they had done on the first day. If you don't remind them, that is, if you bring them to a different room with a different experimenter, you don't ask them any questions, you just start another experiment, then you don't get this effect. What this effect is that some of the items, 20% or more, of the items from the second list were incorrectly attributed to the first list when we asked them to recall the first list. So in our view, the first list was updated because it had been reactivated in, the, in this context. All right? um, so here are two posters here at the meeting that are both talking about this kind of task and things related to it. You can get some more detail by looking at those. So Boxy was a former graduate student, is now looking at this in clinical settings. Very interesting work. All right, we also wanted to look at what's going on in the brain. Uh, we devised a new version of it where the lists were presented on cards so that we could get this into the computer. We now do reactivation in the scanner by playing the sounds associated with the things that they learned. So they learned a bunch of objects that had characteristic sounds. The sounds were played at the same time. Now we reactivate them in the scanner with the sounds, but only with the sounds of some of the objects, not with all of the objects. We picked out some of the objects that were learned sort of in the middle of medium strength, and we reactivated just those objects. And then we come back, we do a recognition test and so on, and then the question is, what's going on in the brain when during the reactivation, and what's going on in the brain when they're learning the second set, especially what's going on when they're learning about the items that they subsequently misattribute to the first set. Right. So what we found, we ran a small number of subjects, but we, we got a kind of a bimodal distribution. These subjects showed lots of these intrusions, lots of this merging of memories. These subjects showed virtually none. We, you could separate them out. Now we ask the question, what's, what is connected to these intrusions, to these, uh, these memory errors? What we found was that the, the level of activity in the visual cortex was related to these intrusion levels, to these incorrect memory errors, but they were negatively correlated. There was no relationship between auditory cortex activation. Remember, we're giving these cues to the auditory system. So somehow the sound is activating the visual representation, and how strongly it activates that representation determines whether or not it's going to be, whether you're going to see these memory errors or not. That's finding number one. That just repeats what I just said. What about those set two items that were incorrectly attributed? What we found here, I'm, this, again, this paper just is published a couple of years ago. You can look at the details if you want. The, the, the single finding I want to focus on here is that the amount of activity, w when a subject was encoding one of those items that got incorrectly attributed, the amount of activity, or the, when they were encoding the second set items, the amount of activity in the TPJ, the temporal parietal junction, is a predictor of whether or not that item is going to end up being incorrectly attributed. The more activity you see in the TPJ, the less likely it is that item is going to end up being incorrectly attributed to the, to the wrong list. Right? So what, what does this mean? Well, we know from lots of other work, I'm not an expert on the TPJ, I'm sure many of you are, but I take it as, as, a, as a consensus view that activity in the TPJ is somehow related to attention to or processing of details of how much detail you attend to or process in memory. So it looks like that the more detail that is activated during the reactivation moment, the less likely you are to get these intrusions in memory. So why would that be? All right? Here's what we think is going on. We think you reactivate a memory. You get brought to a situation. I'm going to give you a cartoon of this in a minute. You get brought to a situation. You reactivate a memory. You can do it along a continuum of detail, more or less detail. You can reactivate that memory with lots of detail, very precise. When you do that, it's probabilistically speaking going to be easier to differentiate that from your current experience. The more detail you have, the easier it is to say, that's not quite what's happening now. You can activate an old memory with very little detail, in which case it's going to be harder. To, it's going to be fuzzy. I don't know quite something like that. 
This is going to lead to differences in the mismatch error when the situation really happens. That's going to affect whether the amount of mismatch is going to affect whether these two events. You've got two things going on in your head, right? You've got the reactivated old memory and the current situation. Do they get put together in some way? Do they get kept separate? This is a classic pattern separation, pattern completion story, and you can think about it that way. So we think that the amount of detail that is, that is brought back by a reactivation of memory is what, through this mechanism of mismatch, is what determines whether the memories get merged or separated. This, by the way, is not, not at all unlike what one sees in the RAT single unit work with, with remapping, rate remapping versus global remapping, sort of map onto these, this distinction rather well. All right, so here's the, the cartoon version of it. Let's say you were lucky enough to get invited to a destination wedding in Aruba. I was. You go to such an event. All right, very nice. Actually, it doesn't look that different from what's out here. It just costs more to get there. Then time goes by. The event fades from memory. In this case, the marriage faded from memory, too. But <laughs> never mind. Now, sometime later, you go to another event. And again, you were lucky this didn't happen, but you could. You go to another event on the beach, somewhat similar, and OK, now this event, you're sitting there. Whoa, this is kind of like your mind is recalling the previous one. Now, either it recalls it with lots of detail, or it recalls it in this kind of fuzzy, hazy way. Right? Now, you, it's clear that under those two circumstances, you're going to have a different outcome. Right? In this outcome, probably you're going to get some of that information bleeding over to sort of refresh the old memory. Here, you've got two pretty strong memories. They're, they're going to butt heads. They're going to stay apart. That's the kind of intuition that the amount of detail in the reactivation is going to determine the dynamics of what happened next. All right, so old memories can be remade by new experiences. That, this fact, if this is a fact, we take it as a fact, this has significant clinical implications. And we've been thinking about those for some time. And I'm going to, going to close by telling you very quickly about a study that we've done, just got published. Again, there'll be a poster on this. I'll show you the poster later. So we know that if you, you can target during sleep reactivation of specific items. Right? That's already been shown. Ken Paller is Ken. Ken is at the meeting. I don't know if he's here now. Ken and others have shown this. We tried to do something a little bit more complicated. We, in this case, being Katie Simon and Rebecca Gomez, and Katie is here, and I, again, I don't know if Rebecca is. So, the way this paradigm works is we first train subjects on a forget tone task. How many of you know the paradigm directed forgetting? Yeah, so I'm in an, I'm in an audience of neurobiologists. Okay. So there is this paradigm where you give people a word list. And for some of the words, you follow it by a sound, a tone. And you tell them, I'm going to read your word list. I want you to remember the words. But the ones that are followed by a tone, forget about them. You don't have to worry about them. And they say it like that, kind of Long Island. Forget about it. And then when you come back later, you say, I was lying. I want you to remember all the words. And then what they give you actually is a reduced re recall of the words that they were supposed to forget. And the assumption is there's some inhibition of the processing of those words once they get the forget signal. We did that. Our interest here was not in the words. It was simply in, in creating a tone that meant forget. Right? So that was the first step. Then we trained them the objects that I talked to you about in the same way I showed you for the imaging study. They learned those objects with their associated sounds. Right? Then they went to sleep in the lab that same night. And during the first period of slow wave sleep, we played some of those sounds. We played the sounds associated with some of those objects. Right? Many times, they didn't wake up. If they woke up, experiment is over. And we followed the sound with the forget tone. So now the question is, for the, for the items that we had activated during sleep, followed with a forget tone, did we knock down the recall of those items? And the answer is yes. Right here, pretty whopping effect. This is the proportion of reactivated objects called. This is the proportion of co control objects called. We looked at op they learned them over four trials, which meant they had four opportunities to get them right during learning. So if they, if they got it right on all four, they were 100%. If they got three out of, on three trials, they were. this was during the learning phase. So we had items of different strength, in other words, that had been correctly recalled on two or three of the learning trials. You can see that the effect is more noticeable if the, if the original learning is a little weaker. Right? You get the effect better with the ones that had only been 
properly recalled twice during learning compared to three, but you see it in both cases. We also, by the way, there's a part of the study I didn't focus on, which is that they learned these objects in a quadrant, and they also learned in spatial location. So for the objects that were reactivated that they did not recall, they also showed a, a loss of the spatial information. For the objects that were reactivated that they did recall, no problem. They remembered where they were in space. So this, this effect during sleep is somehow weakening the memory in certain ways that we don't fully understand. So what's next? I'm just about finished. Is sleep important in producing this effect? We don't know. Could we reactivate two unrelated memories? Could we create and connect two unrelated memories, We're doing, which would be different? Could we create a new association during sleep using this method? Never been tried, to my knowledge. Well, it's been tried, but not in the ways we're describing here. Could we reactivate and then alter meaningful and possibly harmful memories from real life? This is the clinical goal, basically. And that's what we're hoping to do. So some take home messages. Memory engages multiple brain systems. They have different properties. They enable different behaviors. They, dif they differ developmentally. I've already told you all of this. I don't need to repeat it. Reactivating an episode memory renders it fragile and capable of being changed. And whether or not this happens is a function of the strength and detail of reactivation. And memory malleability opens up clinical possibilities. So this is really, I think, an exciting area for where the field is heading. We know at this point, you dial back to when these conferences were first started. If somebody had gotten up at one of those early conferences and says, hey, sleep is really important for memory, wouldn't have happened. So that's how recent this revolution in the understanding of the role of sleep is. Now it's critically important. Irvine understood that and hired somebody who can help him figure out how to make it work. Cool. Shout out to, to Sarah. So what else has changed? This is my final slide, not my next to final slide. This is a picture from the 1984, which was the second conference. They're a little bit small. Here are the people who are presenting at plenary talks at this meeting. Seven of them were at that meeting. Interesting. Here are the five books, by the way, that came from the five conferences. I had to shell out about 100 bucks to get a couple of these. <laughs> You'll notice I'm not going to comment on how well the various people here who are also here aged. I'll leave it to you to figure that out. But the point I want to mention about what's changed is look at the gender balance. Here's, here's uh, Mary Louise Kane, who was in the cognitive science program, worked on language. There's Carol Barnes, I think. I'm having trouble seeing my own. Carol Barnes is here. I think Michaela Gallagher is over here. And that may be, no, there's one more woman here. Who, is this Michaela? I don't know who this is. Anyway, the point is, look at the gender difference here. Look at the gender balance here and look at there. So the field has changed in a positive way. When I look out at what I see, that's pretty positive as well. So I don't know what other comment to make about that other than notice that that's also changed. Our views about memory have changed, but the people who are studying it have changed a little bit, all to the good. All right, so thank you to many of my collaborators. I probably have left some people off over the last 50 years and some various funding sources. And thank you to the organizers again, and thank you. By the way, I wasn't scared that you wouldn't be here, because I know I was talking after Jim. So if I'm talking, to, I figured, unless you all vacated, probably I'd have a good audience. But thank you for staying. Thank you.